Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman in our Northwest Side studio. And I'm Paris Hutch reporting live from just over the Wisconsin border in Kenosha. On the show tonight, Illinois' congressman on the federal response to COVID-19. How long can money from Congress keep buses and trains rolling for essential workers? Advice on how to stay financially afloat during the pandemic. Activists go to court to get inmates released from Illinois prisons and jails. And new ways to consume art at home with a virtual night out at the theater. But first, as I've been doing for the last few weeks, I am out and about around the Chicago area reporting on the coronavirus crisis from the ground. And tonight, I am across the border in Kenosha, Wisconsin, because as you know, it is election day or primary election day here in Wisconsin, and there has been tons of drama. So I will have the latest on all of that in just a moment. But first, Brandis, back to you with the latest developments from Chicago. Paris, thank you. Today, Governor J.B. Pritzker announced there were 73 deaths in the past 24 hours in Illinois, which is the largest single day increase in the state. That brings the total number of deaths to 380. Pritzker also announced more than 1,200 new cases today, bringing the state total to more than 13,500 cases of COVID-19 across 77 Illinois counties. Among the cases, Governor Pritzker says someone in his own office has tested positive. It's okay to let yourself feel all the pain that there is to feel today. I too am grieving, but I want you to know that my grief is only fueling my efforts to fight this virus and win. Pritzker says no other staff in the office are displaying symptoms and he has not gotten tested for the virus. Mayor Lori Lightfoot is extending the city's virus relief to the undocumented community in Chicago. Anywhere where we know that people have not had the same kind of opportunity to get connected up with a health system, to practice preventative care, that's an, an area where we know we've got challenges and we're going to meet those challenges. And those who don't have legal status in the U.S. are now eligible for all relief programs run by the city. This includes access to programs for housing assistance and low interest small business loans. Undocumented immigrants are not included in the $2 trillion federal relief package approved by Congress. Three Illinois congressmen will weigh in on that relief package and more efforts by the federal government in just a few minutes. Deerfield-based Walgreens plans to open 15 drive through testing sites across seven states, including Illinois. The new testing sites will use North Suburban Abbott Lab's new COVID-19 tests that can provide positive results in as little as five minutes and negative results within 13 minutes. Walgreens says the locations are being finalized with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services based on anticipated hotspots. Walgreens plans to be able to test up to 3,000 people per day. The sites are expected to open later this week. And it was a beautiful day today, wasn't it? Temps reaching up to 80 degrees and nearly clear skies. We found a few folks who weren't quite social distancing in Lincoln Park near Belmont and the Drive. Just over a week ago, a frustrated Mayor Lightfoot closed down the Lakefront Trail and other outdoor sites because she said residents weren't heeding the stay at home order. And first there was a scheduled primary election, then there wasn't. And then late last night, after a state Supreme Court ruling, Wisconsin's primary was back on. But not before it led to confusion and a lot of angry voters. As we know, Paris Schutz joins us tonight from the city of Kenosha, just over the Illinois-Wisconsin border. He's been reporting on this story all day, and he's also visited polling sites a little farther north in Milwaukee as well. Paris, what's the scene on the ground there in Wisconsin now? Brandis, it certainly has been a dramatic 24 hours in the state of Wisconsin because of that last minute decision last night to allow voting to go forward today in Wisconsin's primary election as scheduled despite the coronavirus concerns. Now let's take a look at the scene at one of five polling sites in the city of Milwaukee 
That's a city of 600,000 people. And to put things into perspective, there are normally 180 polling sites. But because of the coronavirus crisis, the ability to staff buildings, get the National Guard in there, only five were able to open. So let's rewind a bit. How did the state get here? Well, Wisconsin Governor Tony Evers, a Democratic governor here, issues an executive order yesterday postponing the primary until June because of health concerns. But it's overturned last evening by the Republican-dominated Wisconsin Supreme Court, which said the election must go forward. So that means lines at this polling location up to three hours. And this is in a densely populated ward in Milwaukee. There was a separate curbside voting plan here for people to drive up and vote. So that led to blocks and blocks of stalled cars waiting to vote and then in-person voting lines that were even longer stretched as far as the eye could see poll workers going up trying to help people out make sure they're registered to swift this process along so some voters took it as a sign that milwaukeeans were really turning out in full force other voters were simply angry i think it's absolutely absurd it's fairly clear that this was meant to like affect voter turnout in a negative way I don't think it was an accident. They don't care about people's health at all. They just wanted to try to make sure as few people as possible probably turned out to vote against a lot of what they want. Do you think it was the right move to allow the vote today? Of course, of course. I think it's absolutely fabulous that they're doing this and giving everybody an opportunity. They're actually, you know, looking out for our elderly and handicapped. You know, we got our disabled sticker here and uh, we're just standing in line waiting to vote. Now contrast that scene with Kenosha, a city about one-sixth of the population. They had 10 polling locations that were able to open and be staffed, and there wasn't a line to be found in a couple locations downtown on the waterfront that we visited so people could just walk in, vote, and walk out without waiting. And poll workers across the state took extra precautions like having plastic window dividers between them and voters, plenty of hand sanitizer, portable hand washing stations on hand. But the decision to show up at the polls still carried significant health risks, especially for elderly and vulnerable populations. And so the decision to allow the primary to go forward was met with mixed reaction among some Kenosians. I don't want to not vote. I want to vote, but I'm also afraid. You know, they're the, the state says self-isolation, self-isolation, and then they open up the polls. I think the Republicans should have used better judgment instead of putting our lives at risk. You know, I, I think as long as people do the social distancing, um, although I'm in health care and stuff, as long as we do the social dis distancing, it should be fine. You go uh, out to the drugstore, you go to the uh, grocery store, there's people staying respecting your space. Uh, we're out and about it to take care of necessities. This is a necessity. Another issue here, absentee ballots. We talked to a number of voters who said they ordered absentee ballots, but they never received them. So then what, would do, what do they do? And there were a lot of local reports here about a problem statewide about absentee ballots. And there was also a U.S. Supreme Court decision last night that did not allow the extension of time to return absentee ballots. So they have to be postmarked by today, have to be in the election officials' offices by April 13th at 4 p.m. to be counted. And to add to the contention here, it's not just the Democratic presidential primary, but there are general municipal elections and a Supreme Court race, a state Supreme Court race, featuring uh, a current Supreme Court judge, a conservative, going up against someone who is running against him who is backed by the Democratic governor, Tony Evers. All these things contributing to a lot of drama here in Wisconsin. And we'll be back with more from Kenosha. And also, what about Chicagoans who vacation up in Wisconsin? Do those officials in Wisconsin simply want Chicagoans to stay home this summer? We'll talk about that, but first, Brandis, we go back to you. The, the results of that election should probably tell us a lot, Paris, when we see them. Thank you. And now to Phil Ponce, joined by some members of Illinois' congressional delega delegation. Phil. Brandis, Congress is looking at creating yet another stimulus plan for Americans and businesses sidelined by the coronavirus. That before the current $2.2 trillion bill has yet to be distributed. The bumpy rollout of the aid is just one of the issues that Congress is grappling with. Today, the president fired the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee chairman. That's a position created in the stimulus bill to oversee the administration of the trillions in federal funding. 
Here with their views on the government's pandemic response are Congressman Bill Foster, a Democrat from Illinois' 11th District, which includes Aurora, Naperville, and Joliet, among other areas. Congressman Raja Krishnamurthy, a Democrat representing Illinois' 8th District, which includes Elgin, Schomburg, and Addison. And Congressman Rodney Davis, a downstate Republican whose 13th district includes Taylorville and covers parts of Springfield. Gentlemen, thank you for being with us. And uh, I have to say that it appears that uh, it seems every couple of hours there's a new development in terms of federal aid. Uh, Congressman Krishnamurthy, what is the latest you're hearing in terms of federal aid? Well, um, I think that there will be a, another round of stimulus payments. Um, to businesses, working families, and states and, and local governments. You know, we've kind of put our economy into a medically induced coma, if you will. And so to keep the patient alive, even as we're trying to eradicate the virus, uh, we have to uh, make sure that, for instance, small businesses stay alive and they, they're able to keep their payroll. Um, I was a small business person in the last Great Recession more than a decade ago. And one of my biggest complaints is that a lot of the money that was available to large financial institutions and companies did not trickle down and was not made available to small businesses. So this time around, my office and I worked hard to create a program that would be available to small businesses. Unfortunately, uh, it's not gotten off to the start that we hoped, but now we just have to fix the problems and make sure that the money gets into the hands of small businesses so that they can keep their payrolls. That's the primary um, objective of that program. And we're finding that the money is quickly being exhausted. And so more money should be on the way as part of the next stimulus to make sure that these small businesses can survive. Rodney Davis, uh, we are hearing complaints about the slow rollout. What are your thoughts about uh, how quickly the $2.2 trillion is getting to the people who really need it? Well, the state of Illinois has been awarded millions, just $13 million this week, including uh, including $5 million to community health centers in my district. So money's rolling out, uh, going through existing programs. But at the same time, you've got to remember, the federal government it passed a law together on Friday, a bipartisan way, a week ago Friday. And in a week's time, the federal government has rolled out a $380 billion program. And it's not going to be without kinks. But if it wasn't working, if the money wasn't getting to those mom and pop shops or Main Street businesses that it's intended for, then we certainly wouldn't be talking about infusing more cash into that program to continue to provide that bridge funding for those mom and pop shops that need it to keep their employees employed and to keep their businesses alive for when we defeat this virus and get back to normal. Bill Foster, what is the latest on the delivery of the uh, $1,200 payments that most Americans will get? Uh, what are you hearing in terms of when that might actually happen? Well, there's been a lot of back and forth about what you'd have to qualify for in terms of providing documentation. And I think it's, it's settled down that uh, pretty much, you know, the, the issues are having to document what your income actually is and, um, and Basically, the you know the details along those lines. Uh, people who only had Social Security income initially, uh, it was thought that they'd, ha they'd have to separately file additional paperwork, including potentially, um, you know, file a tax return um, uh, for and or people that you know weren't paying any taxes. And so that they, it looks like those requirements have been opened up. So that really, for most people, um, you know, the simple requirement is you're uh, if you're less than $75,000, you should get the whole $1,200. And between $75,000 and $99,000, the payments will gradually fail, fade out. Um, yeah, we hope that those get delivered electronically within the next uh, three weeks, is I think a, a realistic hope at this point, but we'll see. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, the president has fired the uh, Pandemic Response Accountability Committee chairman, Glenn Fine. He's a person who had a reputation for being aggressive and independent. Uh, he was supposed to oversee how the $2.2 trillion was being sent. Congressman Raj Krishnamurthy, uh, your reaction to that? I'm deeply disturbed. Um, you know, we've never spent this much money on a stimulus package, $2.2 trillion dollars. And this time, the consequences involve not only dollars and cents, 
but lives uh, and, and making sure that people uh, are uh, protected from the pandemic. That's why we baked into this particular package three layers of oversight, a special inspector general uh, for the overseeing of the treasury money called the exchange stabilization funds. It's a large amount of money that goes mainly to large corporations and institutions. Then secondly, a group of people called the Pandemic Response Accountability Commission, um, basically comprising legislative inspectors general. And they named this gentleman, uh, Mr. Fine, as their chairman. And then third, a bipartisan congressional commission. With regard to the uh, uh, PRAC, the Pandemic Response Commission, unfortunately, the president fired the chair that was elected or uh, nominated by the people who were members of that commission. Why, then, excuse me, why do you think the president took that action? Well, unfortunately, this president, um, and I'm a member of the Oversight Committee, and so I can say this uh, with some confidence, um, he doesn't like accountability with regard to his actions and the money that he spends. And this time, we can't abide by that because of the large amount of dollars being spent. He also installed as the Special Inspector General for uh, responsibility um, with regard to the Treasury funds, his own lawyer from the White House. And just last Friday, he fired uh, the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community, a gentleman named Mr. Atkinson. He's the one that first brought to the fore the whistleblower complaint that led to the president's impeachment. Congressman, so I'm going to interrupt you because I'd like to get uh, I'd like to get uh, Congressman Davis in on this. Congressman Davis, his critics say that uh, the president does not like strong inspectors general, uh, does not like strong oversight. He wants to have as much personal flexibility as possible. Are you troubled by the president's moves? Well, this is a process debate. And if if he was troubled by people who are strong and leaders, he would have appointed the EPA's inspector general to take. Uh, to take the place is somebody who's been critical of the administration. That's frankly what inspector generals do. Uh, but this process argument, this process debate that the Democrats in Washington want to take us down this rabbit hole to get into, just like impeachment, just like uh, more oversight than what we've seen over virtually any administration I've served with, uh, it doesn't matter to the families who are hurting right now. What matters to them is let's make sure there's money in the Paycheck Protection Program to get our mom and pop shops, our small businesses, the bridge loans they need to survive and keep their employees employed. Let's make sure that we continue to work together to get these stimulus checks out and make it as easy as possible. As Bill Foster just said, as social security recipients, you're not gonna have to go in and do anything. You're gonna get money sent to you. As long as you qualify, you're gonna get money sent directly to the same account that you get your social security check sent to. So these are the things that are important to my constituents right now, not this stuff that's talking about that, that's talked about in D.C. incessantly. Uh, Bill yeah. Foster, uh, as you look at the big picture, how much confidence do you have in the president's leadership right now? Well, I mean, as a scientist, I have to say uh, that uh, that the what we've been saying about the this administration ignoring scientific advice again and again and again um, is something that we're paying an awful price for. It's interesting to make a comparison with Germany, which is faced, they actually had a lot fewer beds per cap, hospital beds per capita than we did. They weren't better prepared in a number of ways, but they listened to the advice of scientists. Germany, after all, is run by a physicist, Angela Merkel. And we're seeing the difference when you have leadership that listens to scientific advice and leadership that thinks they know it all and can laugh about things that are really terrifying the rest of the world. And so there'll be a lot of time afterwards to look for blame. What we're focused on in Congress is looking forward, and we're in the middle of a war here, and we have to make sure that no more mistakes are made. One of the things that I'm working on is getting the second uh, virus test uh, deployed. This is the so-called antibody test that demonstrates that you have recovered, that you've been uh, exposed to the virus and recovered. It's a simple test. It's, it's something where you prick your finger and put it in a little test kit the size of your thumb that gives you an answer in 15 minutes. And other countries are deploying this at scale so people that know they've had the coronavirus and recovered can then rejoin the economy. And we're going to need hundreds of millions of these in this country. And I know I'm working very hard and my staff is making sure that we have 
of the money and the approval and the scientific progress to get those deployed because they're going to be key to getting us out of this the situation we're in just from an economic point of view. Gentlemen, I'm afraid the time is up and that's where we'll have to leave it, but our many thanks to Congressman Bill Foster, Congressman Rajna Krishnamurthy, and Congressman Rodney Davis. Gentlemen, thank you all. Thank you. Thanks. And up next, how jail and prison officials are handling the pandemic. But first, a look at the weather. Several incarcerated Illinois men have died from complications of the coronavirus. Two inmates who had been housed at the Stateville Correctional Center in Crest Hill and a detainee who had been held at the Cook County Jail. Amanda Venicky joins us now with the latest on the debate over what to do about incarcerated individuals during this pandemic. Amanda. Brandis, the fear is that that death toll is going to increase. Ellen Mills of the Uptown People's Law Center says, these cells are veritable petri dishes for the growth and spread of the coronavirus. Typically, he says, you have prisoners housed two to a cell. There's absolutely no way they can keep six feet of distance from one another, not to mention they come in contact with guards who are at the very least delivering food, which means they've touched trays and bars. They're touching the bars. You're then touching the bars. You're sharing the same bathroom. Uh, so all of those things make it impossible in a, in a prison setting to isolate. And what that means is once the coronavirus gets into a prison, it's going to spread. It's going to spread not only among the prisoners, but from prisoners to staff and back from staff to prisoners in an ongoing uh, exchange of, of viral content, um, which, of course, doesn't stay in the prison. It also goes outside to, to guards' families. The organization is part of a lawsuit asking for a court to demand that Illinois do more to remove prisoners from those so-called petri dishes. Mill says by his group's calculations, about 13,000 inmates could and should be released under tools already available to Governor J.B. Pritzker and to the state's Department of Corrections. Now, as of yesterday, the number of inmates that was released via what's known as medical furlough was at about 450. And then if you also include typical release programs, the governor, he puts that at the number of people released at above 1,000. We are asking the judge to um, sort of prod the Department of Corrections to use the tools it has in a way that releases a lot more people. Our basic concern is we don't think they, the pool of people they're looking at is large enough, and we think that they are using over the restrictive criteria as to who should be released. The governor says already that juvenile justice population is down by 25%, and he says he's actively working to do more. We're doing everything that we can to protect those individuals who remain incarcerated in these facilities, and we are focused on protecting our corrections and juvenile justice staff with PPE and medical checks as they perform a vital function to keep our communities safe. In a filing fighting the lawsuit, the state says the Pritzker administration has acted with, quote, urgent decisiveness, including by bringing in National Guard troops to help at Stateville. The governor also just signed an executive order that makes it easier for the Corrections Department to release inmates because of health concerns, including the coronavirus. No, we're not. This is not open to anybody and everybody uh, that's incarcerated in the state of Illinois. Um, uh, we are. Uh, we have reviewed files, continue to review files of those who are nonviolent offenders, those who are um, pose the least risk to communities. Uh, and we have been uh, working expeditiously as possible to make those reviews. In a filing that is fighting that lawsuit, the state says, quote, an unprecedented mandatory immediate prison release of as many as 16,000 convicted felons is manifestly against the state's and the public's interests. But Mills of the Uptown People's Law Center says the situation now is untenable. He says all Illinois prisons are on quarantine, and that means no visitors are allowed. Mills says he has heard nothing about rioting, but a prison on lockdown at a stressful time like this, he says, could be particularly dangerous. Now, on the opposite side, you have Republican State Representative John Cabello. He's also a detective in the Rockford area. He says the Pritzker 
administration has been too lenient. Cabello was not available to do a video interview, but we did talk by phone today. Cabello told me that Folks are in prison and they should remain there until their time has been served. The Republican says the governor has not done enough to inform lawmakers such as himself, as well as crime victims, when it is releasing prisoners early and what actions it is taking. And he says when elderly prisoners, well, they may be at most danger of COVID, but Cabello says if you're old and you're in prison, then it means you've likely committed a serious crime. Releasing some of these folks is putting the general population at more risk, Cabello told me. Now, this is not just a fight on the state level. Today, you had activists in cars protesting for a long time, actually, outside the Cook County Jail, calling for the release of detainees locally. As of 5 p.m., Sheriff Tom Dart's office said 238 detainees have tested positive for the coronavirus at the Cook County Jail, as well as 115 members of the Sheriff's Office staff. There is another lawsuit in which you have activists and detainees suing for DART to release more individuals from Cook County's jail. In a statement, DART's office says it is working around the clock to combat the unprecedented global pandemic. And he says that detainees who test positive are given medical treatment and they are held in quarantine. Grandis, back to you. A lot to consider, Amanda. Thank you. And still to come on Chicago Tonight, advice on how individuals and families can stay financially afloat during the pandemic. Will an influx of federal money be enough to prop up area transit agencies? There's a new way to consume art at home. We'll show you how. And feeling bored? Well, here's something you can do at home. A new WTTW digital series asks you to rank all things Chicago. But first, we check back in with Paris Schutz in Kenosha near the Illinois-Wisconsin border, where he's joined by the city's mayor, Paris. That's right, Brennis. I am joined by Kenosha Mayor John Antaramian. And uh, John, thank you so much. Mayor, I mean to say, <laughs> thanks for being here. Been quite a dramatic 24 hours. So tell me how you were able to get 10 out of a normal 22 voting precincts ready to go, where a, a giant city like Milwaukee only had five out of 180. Well, I think one of the things that we did is we had been looking at how we were going to prepare for a long time. Um, we had a concern about number of buildings. We went back, checked with the different uh, um, places that we had polling booths, making sure that people were okay with it. Uh, we then started talking to all of our poll workers and getting them on board. But as we discovered, as we came closer and closer to the election and as more things were occurring, people started to drop out and being concerned. So at that point in time, we looked at how do we break it down how do we make it so we don't disenfranchise people who are voting and make sure that we have enough poll workers to, to do what we need to do? And the state came in with the guard to make sure that we were able to get enough people that we had to have to get things done. There were a lot of nervous voters, especially elderly, saying, I don't know if this is safe. How did you try to assuage those concerns of safety? I, I think that every individual has to make certain determinations on how safe and comfortable they are with voting. We pushed very hard to try to get everyone to do absentee ballots and had pushed the governor also, uh, in which case he did attempt to go to an absentee ballot uh, process uh, because that would have been the safest way of doing things. So when it comes to the actual people coming out to vote, it comes down to how comfortable people are and what they're willing to do. Now we did do the things inside the voting booths or voting areas to make them safe. We have plastic in front of all the um, poll workers. So when you sign your book, you slide the book under the plastic, the person signs it, their pen is used, they then take that pen to vote, and then when they're done voting, they dispose of the pen. Um, and so we try to keep things done that way. Everything was wiped down on a continuous basis. So we had that going on in the poll. Uh, all the poll workers had gloves and masks if they wished to wear them, but those were provided to them by the city to make sure that they were safe. And individuals, some individuals actually went above and beyond that and had some of their own type of equipment that they wore which was fine. We did anything we could and to make them comfortable and as safe as possible. Certainly unprecedented times. Different states did different things. Michigan went forward. Illinois went forward. In Ohio, they were able to successfully postpone. Do you agree with the decision the Supreme Court made here to have this election go forward? No, I think it was a mistake. Um, but again, uh, the state statutes require the legislature to do something and the legislature made a determined not to. I think the governor made the, governor made the right call. Uh, regrettably, the courts decided that um, the legislature was right and not the governor. 
You know, there's a lot of contention here in this election. Can you just fill us in on why there's so much drama? It's not just a presidential primary here. No, you also have a Supreme Court race, local Supreme Court race, or not local, state Supreme Court race, uh, which has drawn a great deal of attention and is a very important race depending on what side you're on on things. And so you have a very conservative justice versus a very moderate justice. And so that becomes very important, and I think that's regrettably one of the reasons that this election went forward. We hear the Metro train whistle in the background. That Metro seems to follow us wherever we go. Uh, Mayor, how has Kenosha responded to the coronavirus and, and the stay-at-home order in this state? In general, I think very well. Um, people have done what they're supposed to do. Uh, you always have areas where there are some people who are um, a little more lax than they should be. We well, I notice there's people out here along the lakefront enjoying the, you know, the beautiful sights here, as opposed to Chicago, where the lakefront was closed down. Right. The um, the order that, that we have right now is playgrounds, uh, basketball uh, hoops have been removed, things that where people are going to interact have been removed. However, the walking paths have been left open, uh, in part to keep people so that they, you know, in a sense, have a place to do some walking. Hopefully with social distancing, that concept has been what has been going on in the whole state. Mayor, in the 30 seconds we have left, how about local businesses here? How are they coping? It has been difficult for local businesses, especially the small businesses. Um, but as we move forward, we're all in this together. So it's a question of how do we keep the public safe and not, not um, make it so that anyone gets sick and has the potential of death. So from our perspective, um, we're looking at how we can create some programs internally for small businesses. But I think we're going to be, we'll be fine. We will work through these problems. The community has been through a lot, and um, we will make sure that we move forward. All right, Mayor John Antarami, and thank you so much for joining us here. Thank you for having me. And Brandis, we're going to be back here in just a little bit uh, with the local tourism official to talk about whether or not Chicagoans should stay home for the summer or come up to their favorite vacation spots north of the border. But first, we toss it back to you. Paris, thanks. It'll be interesting to hear about that from our, our neighbors to the north. Up next, money tips for individuals and families during the pandemic. Don't ever miss Chicago tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight Podcast and subscribe. Three weeks into the pandemic-induced statewide shutdown, Illinois families are feeling the financial effects of tens of thousands of lost jobs and lost paychecks. But there is some help coming from the local and federal governments, including the $2 trillion stimulus package known as the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Act, or the CARES Act. It's intended to distribute emergency funds to Americans in the coming weeks. So here to help us navigate the ways these government funds might be able to help fill the financial gaps during the pandemic are personal finance educators Talit and Ty McNeely. Talit and Ty host the podcast The His and Her Money Show. Welcome to you both to Chicago Tonight. Thank you so much for Thank having you. us. We're glad to be here. So first, what is in the CARES Act for individuals and families? Well, there's so much. I mean, the first thing that is on everybody's mind is the stimulus checks. And so it's broken down and based upon the income that you make. So as a single person, if you make $75,000 or below in adjusted gross income, your stimulus check will be $1,200. Now, if you're married and you make $150,000 or below in adjusted gross income, your stimulus check will be $2,400. And then as the income goes up, the stimulus checks go down in the amount that you receive capping out at if you are single and you make above $99,000, you actually are not going to receive a stimulus check. And conversely, if you're married filing jointly and you make over $198,000 in adjusted income, you also will not be receiving a stimulus check. Now, there is great news. Um, those who are not required to file a tax return, such as veterans and those that may be receiving Social Security benefits, you will still be able to get the stimulus checks. However, you do have to file an abbreviated form. We do suggest if you're not familiar with that, definitely contact your local CPA and they can walk you through the steps. Okay, so it sounds like some folks will have to do some things, but what about everybody else? Do you have to apply? Is there a deadline in order to receive this, the check if you qualify? 
Yeah, the good news is you don't have to do anything. Um, if you have filed your 2019 tax returns, they will be basing it off of that. If you have not, they will be basing it off of your 2018 tax returns. Now, for those who may not qualify because of their 2018 and 2019 tax returns, um, kind of knock them out of that earned income, you can still qualify if your income decreases for 2020. So the way that works, we know that some people unfortunately have lost jobs, they may have been furloughed. So by the time they do their 2020 taxes in 2021, they will receive a tax credit towards their income. And how will the payments be distributed? So it's based upon how you filed your tax return. If within your filing, you also put your bank information, then you will receive your check via direct deposit. Now, if, however, you've done your tax returns and you don't have your bank information on hand, then you will receive your checks via postal mail. And that also will affect when you receive your stimulus check. Those who have their banking information on, on, on hand, then they are looking at only about a two-week period from which they will get it. But unfortunately, if your banking information is not on hand, you could be looking at up to a five-month wait to get your checks via the mail. And they will use your last address on file. Okay, um, it's a five month wait. That's if, you know, if I've got to wait for it in the mail, a previous address, how long could it take if all of my ducks are in order? So they're saying that checks can start arriving as early as April 13th. So that's in a couple of weeks and the money should just show up for some people. Yep, that's yep. right. Keep an eye it's, on your bank automatic. accounts. <laughs> right, which is good news for some folks if they're looking for it. Um, but who is or is not eligible? Uh, Tala, you just went through the folks who are, but who's not? So again, if you are at a higher income level, so like for individuals, $99,000 income or higher, you're out, or married, 198,000 combined income or higher, you are out as well. And if you're also older, like you're between the ages of 17 and 24, and you can be claimed as a dependent, unfortunately, um, there will not, your parents or those who are claiming you will not be getting um, a refund or a stimulus in regards to you. So that means college students then? If your parents are still claiming you on their tax return, then you will not. If you are independent of their tax return and you are claiming yourself and no one else is claiming you, then yes, you will receive it. Are there any city or state funds that people can apply for? So there isn't any specific city or state funds that are out there for the individual, but the national government has put a boost with unemployment benefits. So in addition to what our state gives you based on your situation for unemployment, now you can also qualify for an additional $600 per week in a, on top of whatever you were receiving before. And what about, like, what if you didn't file taxes in 2018 or 2019? Yeah, so if you did not file in 2018 or 2019, again, you still have time to file. Um, and if you don't file, when you do file for 2020 in 2021, there is a possibility that you can get a tax credit. What other financial advice? This is the kind of thing you guys talk about a lot. Before I let you go, what other financial advice do you have for folks trying to weather this storm? Yeah, absolutely. So we're telling everyone to make sure that you secure your four walls. So you need to make sure, if possible, you can keep a roof over your head. Don't do a lot of unnecessary spending right now. Um, and we do want you to also build your emergency fund. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people that may have not had an emergency fund in place when all of this started, but now it's not, it's not too late basically to get it started. It's also a good idea to contact the people that you owe. Uh, if you have a car payment, if you have mortgage or rent, if you have credit card payments, contact them, see what programs they have. A lot of companies are deferring payments. A lot of companies are reducing interest rates or cutting out interest rates or allowing you to do different things, but you will not know about it because those things will not happen automatically. It's gonna be up to you to be proactive, contact them and see what help is available. Okay, useful financial advice from Talit and Ty McNeely. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank, Thank you for you. having us. Ridership on public transit in the Chicago area and around the U.S. has dropped dramatically during the coronavirus pandemic as much as 90 percent. The federal bailout package signed into law late last month included $25 billion for transit agencies. But as Chicago, Chicago Tonight's Nick Blumberg reports, advocates think it's likely more funding will be needed.
Under the CARES Act, the Chicago area's public transportation systems got $1.43 billion, funding that can be used for operating expenses to keep trains and buses running. Typically, federal money can only go to capital things like rolling stock, rails, bus station, but this uh, funding is allowed to go to operating, so that's a critical support in this crisis. Based on the 2020 budget for the regional transit boards, the $1.4 billion from Congress should cover the loss in fare revenue that comes with the ridership drop. But that's not the full picture. We know that other major revenue sources are going to be down, especially sales tax um, and gas tax, which are the biggest contributors to capital and operating funds for the transit agencies. Even before the pandemic, CTA, Metra, and PACE were facing challenges, like an estimated $30 billion in capital needs over the next decade. Some hope a rumored federal infrastructure bill on the way will include money for transit improvements. My hope is that an infrastructure bill can address global climate change and providing more alternatives beyond highways. So I hope for that at the federal level. I won't necessarily say I expect that. On top of all of that, there's something else the transit analysts are thinking a lot about. When, or even if, is ridership going to return to pre-pandemic levels? Ridership was declining even before COVID-19. An extended recession, people continuing to work from home, or people choosing other options could further weaken transit systems and could mean service cuts, hurting those who don't have another way to get around. Over a quarter of Chicago households don't own a car. We need to have a healthy transit system in this region um, because our, our city and our region and our businesses are built depending on that. What else can be done? State action is uncertain. Many advocates want to see changes to what's called the fare box recovery ratio. By law, half the revenue area transit agencies take in must come from fares, a higher benchmark than many peers, and a big budget challenge. Future money from Congress is also possible. The group Transportation for America says it may be needed, since transit around the U.S. has been hit hard, not just by the cost of running buses and trains, but also the stepped up spending to clean um, uh, and provide personal protective equipment to frontline workers. That, so it's both a reduction in, um, in, in revenue and some increased operating expenses. Local advocates hope this influx of federal money will pay for masks and gloves for transit workers, which their unions have been calling for for weeks. Protecting workers' health and the health of the nation's transit system will be top of mind for many in the months ahead. It needs to be there. And if we don't provide the operating support today, then it cannot be there today and it won't be there tomorrow. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Nick Blumberg. And we should learn more about how local transit agencies are handling the pandemic fallout and how they plan to spend their federal funds soon. The CTA, Metra, PACE and RTA boards are all scheduled to meet over the next 10 days. And now we check back in with Paris Schutz, who's co-anchoring from just north of the Illinois border in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Paris. Yeah, Brandis, and joining us now to talk about the impact of COVID-19 on the economy and tourism here in Wisconsin. Lots of popular vacation spots in Wisconsin, obviously, for Chicagoans. We're joined by Dennis Duchesne, president of Visit Kenosha, the city's tourism bureau. Welcome to Chicago Tonight. Thank you for having us. So uh, someone uh, from a popular vacation town uh, north of here said the message there was going to be Chicagoans stay home this summer unless you have a vacation home quarantine for 14 days. What about you? What, what's your message to people that might want to come up and visit from Illinois? Well, since this started, I mean, our message has been pretty consistent. We'd like folks to stay home and be safe and listen to your local health officials. And uh, now is the time to take care of yourself and your family um, and be respectful of those that are on the front lines taking care of us. So how do you balance, you know, the economic boost you get from tourism with safety and staying healthy? Um, really, we haven't been focusing on tourism that much in the past few weeks. It's been focusing on the local community. Um, a lot of our small businesses uh, have drastically changed their operating plans. Um, a lot of restaurants are curbside pickup um, and are adapting that way. And what we're doing is encouraging our local residents. You know, you still want to go out to eat and have food. It's buy local now and take care of our local partners so that when the tourism economy comes back, 
you know, they're still here and healthy and ready to serve well, customers do you think from Chicago. That tourism economy will come back this summer. Do you want Chicago residents to come up here, say the June, July, August months? We certainly want Chicago residents to come up here, but we want to make sure it's the right time. You know, Kenosha is known for lots of festivals, lakefront festivals, parades in the summer. Are those going to go on as planned? Uh, some have been canceled. Some are going on. Um, it's kind of a day-to-day -day thing. Um, we look to the local health officials and our local municipalities to make those decisions. And uh, you can visit our website at visitkenosha.com. And we have an updated uh, page on our homepage for local businesses that are open and how they're adapting to the economy. And then we also keep our event page up to date as best we can, too. You know, one of the things Kenosha, as well as a lot of areas around here, was counting on was the Democratic National Convention in Milwaukee. You had a lot of hotel rooms booked here. What's going to happen with those? Uh, well, they'll, they won't be here in July. Um, they tentatively moved it to August. Um, they are working with our local properties to redo some of those room blocks. And we are hope that they're successful in doing that. And with everything else, we'll just kind of have to wait and see. Can you give us a sense of how big a hit the local economy takes when you lose out on that kind of revenue? Uh, it's several million dollars. I mean, the tourism economy here is approximately $227 million in 2018. Um, so yeah, I'm sure it will take a substantial hit. Hotels at the time it hit were running, you know, fairly high occupancy. We had a special event in town. We were probably at over 90% for that weekend. That was on a Thursday. By Thursday afternoon, they're 10 to 15 percent occupancy. So, hmm. and that's just one property. Wow. So, multiply that by a lot, and it's quite an impact. All right, mm -hmm. Dennis Duchesne, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. All right, Brandis, well, that's it from here for now, and we will be back to wrap things up right before the end of the show, but now we toss it back to you. Yeah, Paris, of course, it's impacting every part of the economy. Thanks. We'll see you in a minute. As you work through your list of ways to stay entertained while quarantined at home, a Chicago theater wants to be added to your list. Theater Wit is now live streaming the last play their stage saw before doors closed, Teenage Dick. Described as pretty hilarious take on Shakespeare's Richard III, they say it makes for the perfect night in. Arts correspondent Angel Edo spoke with the artistic director to learn more about this new way to consume art at home. You do know this Sadie Hawkins dance is where the girl asks the guy out. I am like the only girl who talks to you. It's not the same as, uh, as, as Netflix. It's not the same as film. It's a different relationship to the viewer. It's a different experience. The experience artistic director, Jeremy Weschler of Theater Wit is referring to is Teenage Dick, a Chicago play in the middle of its virtual run. Pretty raucous and hilarious take on Richard III. The play itself, in addition to kind of being super fun as a kind of mashup of like, election and you know 10 things i hate about you some of those teen comedies and shakespeare right uh it does have some serious things to, that it is talking about in terms of like the relationship of the disabled community um to the to the abled and how a lot of you know preconceptions really interfere in clear communication between the, the, these two groups the virtual experience really requires viewers to make a night of it, as Weschler describes, as they watch a recording of the play taken during the final rehearsal week. The 100-minute show requires a ticket purchase for a reserved time and date, just like you would do if going to the theater. From there, ticket holders are given a private URL and password where viewers can enjoy the show only one time. I think this is about you know, connecting people to the cultural life of Chicago as a whole, and then bringing some of that cultural life of Chicago outside. So we've had a number of people from other states getting to watch the show, which they would never get to do. So people hear all sorts of things about Chicago's small theater scene, which is the best in the country right now, and nobody can see it. Well, let's focus on the text. After the show, viewers can participate in a live post-show discussion with the cast and crew, an experience Weschler says is imperative during this time. It is important to reinforce that you don't just live alone and, and plan out your w weekly grocery run, that you are still part of a larger community, and it's not a community defined solely by responding to quarantine. It is a community defined by a whole set of shared cultural values and interests that you know, can find their expression in, in, you know, in a play like Teenage Dick or in any number of other spaces. But having that sense of connection to the larger culture, I, I think is, is invaluable right now. 
with half of the performances to date already sold out, Weschler says the message behind Teenage Dick couldn't be more timely. And one of the things that I think is remarkable about the play right now, the disabled community has long been dealing with difficulty traveling, health fragility, the, the daily complexity of planning any number of, of uh, regular activities that you or I would consider perfectly mundane. Um, and all of a sudden, everyone found themselves in this place to see this group of people overcoming odds in the midst of a thing that has basically completely disoriented us. Um, and I think, I think there's something valuable that people can take away from the experience apart from you know the jokes in the play. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Ito. Theater Wits Teenage Dick has been extended through Sunday, May 3rd, with shows running Thursdays through Sundays. Up next, a new WTTW digital series features another activity you can do from home. Don't miss one of our stories. Get them all delivered to your desktop or mobile device with a subscription to the WTTW News Daily Briefing. Go to WTTW.com slash Daily Briefing and sign up. When it comes to sports these past few weeks, it's been like an endless rain delay. Mayor Lightfoot launched a new campaign with Chicago sports teams called We Are Not Playing to say in the mayor's words, they're not playing and neither are we. But something you can play from home, WTTW's Chicago Showdown Series. Chicago Tonight producer Erica Gunderson joins us now to tell us what it's about. She's at home. Erica, what is the Chicago <laughs> Showdown Series? Hi, Brandis. Um, so the Chicago Showdown series, it was kind of the brainchild of another producer, Nick Blumberg and I. We're both native Chicagoans and we're like a lot of other Chicagoans and that our favorite things are talking about Chicago and also arguing about Chicago. Um, so a while back, we cooked up this idea of Chicago themed bracket style competitions where people could vote on the best of different Chicago categories. So like imagine uh, your March Madness office tournament bracket. We'd originally planned for them to run actually concurrently with the March Madness tournament, tournament, but when that was canceled, we decided that, you know, with the news so serious right now, uh, folks could still use a little bit of light entertainment. And if you're sheltering in place with people that you're gonna argue with anyway, you may as well have some fun stuff to argue about instead of who's gonna clean the toilet. <laughs> like our family here, you guys argue about Chicago. Um, what have the brackets focused on each week? So uh, this is our fourth week, um, our fourth and final week. And the first three weeks themes were uh, lost architecture, Chicago musicians, and movies set in Chicago. So each week started with a round of 16 that viewer votes brought down to a final winner on Friday. Um, and for the first week, we looked at some of the architectural treasures that Chicago has lost in the last century or so. So think the home insurance building, old Comiskey Park, Prentice Hospital. Um, the second week, we, we had to get down to actually just 16 of the greatest musicians in Chicago. Um, so think Earth, Wind and Fire, Benny Goodman, Kanye West. That was next to impossible just to get to that phase of 16 because uh, there are so many great musicians from Chicago. Um, and then for the third week, we voted on the best movies set in Chicago. So that one actually wound up setting some really difficult choices, especially as we got onto the final rounds. You know, how do you choose? between the untouchables and the fugitive. It's like choosing between your children. Oh, come on, it's not that hard to pick a kid, Erica. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what about the last week and how can watching. we participate? Don't tell them. Uh, They're not watching. <laughs> so, uh, the, so this last week, um, like I said, uh, the first three weeks there was voting and that's over, but you can go back and look at the first three weeks of competition, see if you agree with the ultimate winners, see some of the impossible matches that were in there. Um, but for this week, the final week, we decided to depart from the bracket format and instead salute the people who under normal circumstances we would see every day. So think people like your favorite bartender, street performers, chatty L train operators, all of those people that you see in your day to day that just make it feel like Chicago. Um, you know, I think right now we're all in our feelings a little bit. You know, it's a gorgeous day today. I would love to sit on my front porch and see the you know neighborhood Paleta man come by. Um, and so, you know, I think we're all feeling that loss, but that's why we wanted to let those people know, those everyday people that we're thinking about them, we miss them, we hope they're okay, and we really can't wait to see them again and, you know, argue about movies. So um, now we're asking viewers to chime in um, and tell us about the people that they're missing, um, who, who those people are. So we're asking folks to hop on social media and tweet about it, 
comment on Facebook, comment on our website, just use the hashtag Chicago Tonight and tell us, you know, how much you miss your favorite barista or the guy who plays half of the Sanford and Son theme downtown. All of those people that you wish you could see again, that we'll see again, hopefully sometime soon, um, let us know who they are. We'd love to hear about it and give them a little bit of love. Awesome, a fun way to celebrate Chicago. Chicago Tonight exactly. producer, Erica Gunderson, thanks so much. Thank you. And you can find the whole list of icons, how to participate, and the previous weeks of the Chicago Showdown series on our website. Of course, it's WTTW.com slash news. And that's our show for this Tuesday night. Paris, what was your biggest takeaway from your reporting in Kenosha today? Certainly those lines in Milwaukee and that this is going to reverberate for a long time, especially in a place like Milwaukee, where only five precincts out of 180 were open. A lot of voters saying they felt disenfranchised and long lines like that. Lack of voter access can lead to suppressing of turnout, although on the other side, there was beautiful weather. So at least people didn't have to stand in the cold. And with the coronavirus shutdowns, perhaps a lot of people weren't working or at their jobs so they could scatter when they could come out, just like it happened in Illinois. But of course, this controversy was w happened in Illinois and Michigan and uh, and uh, Ohio. So certainly unprecedented times for elections and for everything else right now. OK, it'll be interesting to see those results. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing and you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube and our website WTTW.com slash news. And you can also catch the show via podcast in the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. That's right, an exit interview with interim Chicago Police Superintendent Charlie Beck and a pair of local bluesmen adapt to a changing music scene. And now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you for watching. Have a great night. Closed captioning for this program is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, pleased to give back to the community through numerous charitable initiatives.